Hey everyone, this is Mason and you're listening to Herb Rally. Today's episode is another edition of the Herbalist Hour and this time I'm joined by herbalist, author, mycologist, naturalist, chef, uh, Jess Starwood. So I've known of Jess and her work for quite some time now. She wrote a beautiful book called Mushroom Wanderland and we chat quite a bit about that in this podcast episode today. Uh, We also chat about the aroma of Matsutake, one of my personal favorite mushrooms, Hoshigaki, Uh, and her fondness for persimmons. We chat about traveling with a forager's perspective, the mycology community overall, and a whole lot more. To learn more about Jess and her work, you'd go to jstarwood.com. That's where you can pick up the book. Uh, She's got signed copies there. And yeah, just was a really lovely chat. Hope you enjoy as well. Also, guess what? It's the United Plant Savers 30th anniversary this year. And to celebrate it, they'd love to grow their member community to be larger than it's ever been before. Can you help them get to 10,000 members this year? They are offering a $5 off coupon in March for anyone who joins or renews with code MARCH2024 at checkout. I will leave links and details at the tippy top of today's podcast show notes. And when you join this month, this month only, you'll get a $75 gift card to use towards classes in the International Herb Symposium's Learning Center, which is pretty awesome. There are a ton of amazing herbal classes in the International Herb Symposium's Learning Center. So so again, that's $5 off United Plant Savers membership in the month of March of 2024 by using coupon code MARCH2024 at checkout. So there's lots of other membership benefits along with just helping out this wonderful nonprofit that all of us herbalists know and love, including discounts to planting the future conferences. You get discounted lodging at their botanical sanctuary yurt and nearby Brickhouse Apothecary. Membership includes eligibility for UPS community grants. You, there's invitation to members only fall equinox camp out. That's this September. You also get a printed copy of the Journal of Medicinal Plant Conservation. So again, please help us reach 10,000 members for the United Plant Savers. Don't forget to use coupon code March2024 at checkout to get $5 off your membership fees. And again, that's whether you're a new member or a renewing member. And before we get into the show, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, and that is Oshala Farm. You can learn more about them at oshalafarm.com. That's O-S-H-A-L-A farm.com. They grow and sell over 80 medicinal plants, and they're beautiful farm and located in southern Oregon. That's the Applegate Valley. I've been there many a time, so I could test to the quality of their growing operations. So uh, if you're looking to purchase organic, medicinal, US grown herbs, spices, teas, you name it, uh, check out Oshala Farm at oshalafarm.com. Also big thanks to our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members. You know who you are. We really could not do this without you. So thank you so much for the support. If you'd like to learn more about how to support the Herbalist Hour and Herb Rally, you could become a Herb Rally Schoolhouse member by going to herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. It's only $10 a month, but you could try your first 30 days for free using coupon code podcast at checkout. So thanks once again to our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members, Oshala Farm, and to Jess Starwood for joining us on the show. So that's going to do it for me today. Hope you enjoyed today's episode, and I'll talk to you very, very soon. Take care. Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today, I'm really excited to have on Jess Starwood. Welcome to the show, Jess. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Glad to have you. You know, we've had a bit of communication over the years, and I want to say this might be our first time formally chatting with each other. But um, so you're a chef, forager, mycologist, and herbalist, and that's a lot of different hats to wear. I'm just kind of curious, kind of which came first, and how did all the other interests of yours start weaving into each other? Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, well, I mean, herbalism and food pretty much happened simultaneously. Um, and, you know, I really began to realize that, you know, food is our medicine. So, mm-hmm. you know, they both really kind of go hand in hand. And, um, and yeah, food was really what I was interested in most. Um, I got into cooking uh probably 15 years ago or so and just you know tried to push it as far as i could and and get to a cuisine that is as close to what nature provides um and like what are we supposed to be eating um instead of 
you know, something from a package that no longer resembles food, you know? So that has kind of guided my journey, at least for the beginning of it. Um, and then I realized, you know, it's so much more uh, than than just sitting down to eat. There's a whole, whole uh, uh, other elements to all of that. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah, wild food does have a lot more nutrient density to it, doesn't it? Um, I suppose when people hear about you and your work, they probably have this assumption that you're consuming like a hundred percent wild diet, but that's probably <laughs> not the case, right? Uh, not the case, especially uh, having two teen daughters that turn their noses right. up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at anything that may have come from the ground. Uh, right. But you know, they're they're coming around, and and also it's it is a very challenging, you know, way to live. Uh, especially to keep up with the modern world. It's like, yeah, I could eat, you know, 100% wild food, but I still have a mortgage to pay. I still have right. bills to pay. Right. And so it's, it is doable, but yeah. you have to sacrifice an awful lot to, to get to that point. So finding that, uh, you know, uh, an appropriate balance is, I think, the key. So you mentioned being a mother to two teenage gals. Uh, my daughter's 12, so she's fast approaching that. But, you know, she's 12 going on 13 for sure. But um, how do you kind of uh, look at that as far as raising them with uh, nutrition in mind? Do you kind of, the way, the way I kind of do it is like the 80-20 rule where I'm like, you know, as long as my daughter's eating 80% pretty well, you know, I think it's okay to let them have the junk food on occasion. I guess part of the reason I say that is because I'm afraid of... Um, developing taboos or how do you kind of look at that as far as like raising children to be conscious about what they're eating but also not you know going all in i suppose Ooh, that's a that's a tricky one um yeah. and one that i mean it's been a journey um when they were very young uh when they were first born actually you know that's when i started down the rabbit hole of you know, eating cleaner and, you know, even vegetarian and veganism. And even I did a pretty long stint with raw food. And while, you know, you can get really mixed up in these ideals and like, what's food, what's not food. And, you know, of course, as a mother, like, I'm going to want the best for my kids. Right. But, you know, having their their other parent um, with completely different values and ideas right. about food, which I hadn't, you know, I, I didn't, you know, that wasn't a thing when we were together before kids, but then, you know, I had this kind of awakening of like, oh, I need to feed these kids good food. Um, and he wasn't on board with that. So that in itself was a huge battle. Um, and then you know, as they got into school, all of these other elements that I had tried to, you know, shield them from, you know, the candy, the processed food, the, the you know, the stuff that's like, oh, I, there's no way that, you know, my kids should be eating this junk. I know how bad it is. Yeah. And then, you know, over the years, just relaxing into the idea that, you know what, this is the world that we live in. And even though it felt... Uh, it was tough for me. It was really tough to, you know, be like, okay, yeah, you can, you can eat this, this uh, stuff that is not really food. Um, and I see, you know, the, the effects, you know, on them. Oh, totally. But then, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's on their own journey. And right. um, last thing I want to do is, is to, you know, make somebody feel bad for their food choices. And, and, they're going to have to learn as they get older um, and see what works for them, what doesn't work. And I'm, I just hope, but I mean, I also know that like they've been around this other alternative um, idea about food and, you know, maybe they'll come back to it when they get older and realize that, Oh, mom was onto something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, yeah, I can only I can only guide, um, but not um, you know control. So, amen. Yeah, I have this optimistic view that my daughter will also kind of come around and you know 
I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? But they're their own people, and we, we can only do the best we can do. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah. So along with being a forager, uh, you're also an author. Mm -hmm. uh, so you wrote a book, uh, I want to say in 2021, called Mushroom Wonderland. That, yeah. I originally read that as Wonderland, but it's Wonderland. <laughs> I like that. A yeah. forager's guide to finding, identifying, and using more than 25 wild fungi. Uh, can you tell us more about that book? Sure. Um, yeah, when I <laughs> suggested the title to my publisher, they were like thinking I had a typo. And I'm like, no, but <laughs> I was actually very surprised that they went with it. Um, and they thought it was a good idea. So it's like, yeah, you know, um, cool. and it really kind of emphasizes the idea of my, you know, my perspective of hunting mushrooms is, you know, it's it's a wander in the woods. It's not a trip to the grocery store, you know, mm. and it's takes into account the whole picture of, you know, getting to know your land, getting to know the environment you're around and learning to read it, learning to see areas where there might be mushrooms and coming back the following years and learning what shows up there and what doesn't. And, um, you know, it's kind of a, you know, shares a, a way of life. Um, I have a lot of stories in there. Um, there's a fun story about getting lost in the woods and having to get rescued and um, so that's fun. And, and I think that's what, I'll, you know, I meet a lot of other mushroom hunters and I hear a lot of similar stories and, and just how, you know, by learning how to hunt mushrooms, they've developed a better connection with the earth, you know, and, and the land and, and the seasons and, and the weather and, and, and their food as well. I wish I had the book in front of me. I remember we had a copy when, in the office when I worked at Mountain Rose Herbs. It's an absolutely gorgeous book. I'd actually like to read one of the book reviews. Um, there's a ton of great reviews on your on the Amazon page, at least. And a lot of them are super long. So I just chose a short one. That's how I <laughs> decided to read this one. But um, so they say, the book is a work of art. Get the, get the book for the full experience. The book has a look and feel that sets it apart as something very special. People of all ages and interests will find the experience captivating while flipping through the pages. Once the hook has been set, Jess, the wordsmith, further draws her readers into the world of wonder and the world of mushrooms. Um, so, yeah, what a great review. And a lot of people kind of comment on how beautiful it is. Uh, people talk about having it as like a coffee table book and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you took the pictures, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I Other than... There's like two or three in there that I didn't because um, I had my publish publisher gave me six months to write and photograph the whole book. Um, wow. I, <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, I had originally proposed a wild food cookbook and mm. they're like, you know what? No, we want a mushroom book. And I'm like, OK, that's cool. Um, mushroom mm. season just ended in Southern California. So <laughs> there's no mushrooms <laughs> or another, you know nine months. So I ended up having to travel all across the country to track down uh, mushrooms to photograph. So oh. that that was, I mean, it all happened during COVID and everything was shut down. And luckily, I was able to travel um, to the East Coast and Pacific Northwest and Rocky Mountains. And it was a really, really fun process, you know, um, getting to know other foragers in other areas and be like, hey, okay, I know it's mushrooms and I know you have all the secret spots. I just, if you could maybe share a couple, I just want to take a picture and I will leave your patch alone. I promise. Um, <laughs> mushroom hunters are very secretive about their spots, but it was awesome to meet people who, you know, total strangers on the internet but then they were like, yeah, yeah, you know what? Come on out and I'll show you my black trumpet spot or my chanterelle spot. And I was just blown away by the, the people that I got to meet in that process. So yeah, beautiful photography. You mentioned stories. Um, there's also, I want to say recipes in there as well. How is the book kind of broken up? Is it by mushroom or yeah, how's it how's the book broken up? Um, yeah, so I profile basically the top what I've chose is the top 25 mushrooms that I find are the most useful most interesting and 
the more easier to find and identify. Um, so it's really a book for beginners, but I profile each mushroom uh, with photos and descriptions, um, what to look for, how to find them. Um, and then I also have a section on, um, well, I did break them up into culinary mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms, and then I also pointed out some toxic mushrooms as well. Okay. Um, and then recipes and stories sprinkled throughout. Just a quick break from the show to thank our presenting sponsor, Oshala Farm. Oshala Farm is a beautiful and vibrant certified organic herb farm based in Southern Oregon, where they grow and sell over 80 different plant species. The founders, Elise and Jeff Higley, have been longtime friends, so I highly trust their growing methods and ethics. You'll love the potency and vibrancy of all the herbs they have to offer. To learn more and purchase their herbs and other organic goods, head to oshalafarm.com. So thanks once again to Oshala Farm for sponsoring the Herbalist Hour. Now back to the show. Enjoy. So on the description, I, I read this on the Amazon website. By the way, before I move on, is there a place you'd like to send folks to purchase the book? Um, mm. I saw you have signed copies on your website. I do. I uh, Yeah, if you go to my website, um, I have my apothecary shop that also has um, books available there. I will sign them, um, maybe even throw a couple stickers in there too there you go <laughs> um yeah so signed copies are available on my website but if you want a cheaper version you can always go to amazon there you go but regardless dear listener please leave a review on amazon because it does help the author out but if you really want to support the author uh, go to jstarwood.com and under the store section i want to say there's you could purchase a signed copy um but on the description of the book it says the breathtaking beauty of mushrooms from master forager how do i know how to identify and use them in cooking, home remedies, and spirituality. So the spirituality aspect piqued my interest, and I was just kind of curious, how are you looking at um, using mushrooms in a spiritual sense? Uh, am I to assume we're talking like psilocybin here? Or I've also uh, uh, heard reishi, like reishi mushroom, has been a very strong spiritual mushroom as well. But how do you look at spirituality and mycology? Um, well, on a... Uh, chemical basis, you know, yeah, uh, yes, you can put uh, psilocybin and, and even Amanita muscaria into that category. Um, but, you know, I feel like the whole process of mushroom hunting can be a spiritual experience. Um, you know, spiritualism is going to be different for everybody. And, but for me, it's about connection, you know, and developing that connection to uh, what you're eating to your environment, to your community, to everything around you. So, um, so yes, mushrooms have been a direct access to my form of spirituality. And, you know, like I said, that's going to look different for everybody. Um, but I feel like that's, that's, um, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you can take some psilocybin mushrooms and go <laughs> wander in the woods and you're really, really going to have that experience, you know? Um, Otherwise, um, yeah, and even just a walk in the woods without consuming anything is is going to bring on, you know, a sense of connectedness. I love that you say that. And it's, of course, my shallow brain goes immediately like, oh, you got to take psilocybin. That's, of course, what she's referring <laughs> to. But um, a lot of the listeners know my story. And um, uh, I went to the Columbine School of Botanical Studies back in 2011. And I was all about adaptogens and sexy herbs like that and you know they're all in cut and sifted jars and it wasn't until i went out in the you know old growth forests in western cascades mm -hmm. oregon uh where they don't outright advertise their school as a spiritual uh experience uh but you definitely end up you can't help but have a spiritual experience when you're out in the old growth forest looking at tiny little flowers through loops for hours on end so I'm so yeah. glad you you brought that up because it really is, yeah, all you need to do is a walk in the woods and that is the spiritual aspect to it. Absolutely. So you uh, wrote about one of my favorite mushrooms, the Matsutake, which does grow mm -hmm. in Oregon. Uh, does Matsutake grow around you in the Los Angeles area? Uh, there are rumors. Oh, okay. But, uh it's a <laughs> you you uh, mycologist yes yeah. yes i know okay. i know <laughs> we won't give away your spot um they are in california yes i'll say that right there you go yep all right 
So you recently wrote on your blog about Matsutake, which I want to say from memory, Matsu uh, is, it means pine mushroom. Am I getting that right? Okay, cool. Yeah, that's the pine uh, mushroom. It is the aroma. So this is, kind of shows your beautiful prose here, right here. Um, this was on your blog. I want to say it was your most recent post. Uh, it is, well, you were referring to the smell. You were you mm -hmm. were saying something about how you don't like how people usually describe the smell of, smell of Matsutake. So you say, it is the aroma of an old wooden house in the northern woods, damp, dark, mossy, with a library of hundred-year-old books and crowding the shelves, creaking floorboards, dripping fog, and steel pines just out the draft, just outside the drafty window. A tea kettle bubbling on the wood-burning stove. The fog filter light coming in the window is the is indiscernible whether it is morning or afternoon. But a cup of warm spiced tea is almost ready to, ready to be sipped from a favorite mug. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. really puts you in a that really puts you in a place and i could just kind of visualize where i've harvest harvested a matsutake before but um really i'm just kind of curious if you could kind of talk about your fondness for matsutake mushroom and what you love about it absolutely uh so yeah i so when i first heard about this mushroom and there's this classic description of it uh that was popularized by david aurora um, mm. uh, he's a very well-known mycologist. Uh, he he says that it smells like dirty gym socks and red hots. <laughs> and I'm like, that does not sound like one of the most sought after mushrooms in the world. Like that just doesn't sound appetizing to me. Um, so I've been hunting Matsutake for quite some time. I found, um, well, a couple of years ago, I found probably with a friend found maybe 40 pounds of matsutake on the east coast um and it just i was bathing in that uh aroma you know it was just just magical and i just couldn't get past the idea like that that was not that that description felt just you know i could see where he's coming from but I'm like, there's more to it than that. There's more depth. There's more, um, you know, there's more to it. So, and really this description uh, came to me just out of the blue um, recently. Uh, my friend in LA had bought some from uh, the Asian market and he's like, here, you know, what do you think of these? Do you think these smell pretty good for being, you know, store-bought? And I smelled them and I was like, and, and just that whole scene that I described just mm. seemed to overwhelm me. And I'm like, that's it. That was it. It was just this, you know, click of it's some, there's something so ah, just amazing to it. Um, all those words, you know? Um, Absolutely. And that's another thing about what I, I do is, you know, I'm bringing people out to the to the woods or uh, the desert or wherever, and seeing people experience scents and flavors and you know aromas, um, tastes that they've never experienced before, and there's no words to describe them. You know, so getting people in touch with those um, senses is really fun to be part of. You know, and um, especially with wild food and working with chefs who, uh, you know, they're not used to these other flavors and a lot of times they don't know what to do with them and how they pair with other things or how to, um, really accentuate their note, different notes, you know? So, um, I think it's just a really fun area to work in. I've never been to crazy fancy uh, restaurants in the Los Angeles area. And I've never seen Matsutake on a menu before. How have you seen Matsutake used uh, at these fancy restaurants? Um, well, it can be, you know, some a lot of times people think that they are to be cooked like every other mushroom. Mm. You know, throw it in the pan with lots of butter, lots of garlic, lots of um, salt and uh, other flavors but that ruins it you lose all of that flavor um i'm sorry aroma and because yeah. all those volatile oils are gonna just they're very 
transient, you know, and you're going to lose that if you don't capture it. So mm. um, the best way is going to be some way to, you know, hold on to those. And the less competing flavors you have, the better. Um, just a pot of rice with some sliced matsutake in it, steamed, mm. is phenomenal. Like you really get that full experience. You don't have to add butter and oil and and garlic and all these other things to it. It's it's um, you know it's just a, su a subtle flavor that is you know helps you to appreciate those those little smaller things in life. You know, absolutely. I've been changing a lot of the way I um, prepare food, and I used to overly rely on, like you said, butter and garlic, <laughs> and um, I haven't been using nearly as much butter in, in my cooking lately. And I think you're right. It really does help you capture the the flavor of the ingredient a lot more. And like you were saying, part of the beauty of mushrooms is the smell. I've never mm -hmm. really thought about the fact that you're trying to preserve that. Um, so, all right. So lightly steamed matsutake mushrooms over some white rice. I love that. Or even tempura because you're encapsulating mm. it in the batter and then it Ooh, steams yeah. it inside. Mm, mm. So good. I love so it. good. Yeah. I brought this up a couple times on the show before. For whatever reason, I felt compelled to tincture matsutake one time. Have you ever um, tinctured these culinary mushrooms? I've also uh, tinctured chanterelles. I've tinctured, I want to say, candy caps, uh, lobster mushrooms, just for funsies, just to try to get that flavor and whatnot. Um, and I presume that there's a medicinal effect in these mushrooms as well. Do you ever tincture these mushrooms? Um, I have infused matsutake in whiskey before. Mm. Um, so technically a tincture. Mm -hmm. um, and... Strictly for like the flavor and the enjoyment of yeah. that. That's mm -hmm, awesome. Mm -hmm. But it does bring out more of the mushroomy uh, notes as well. So I'm still experimenting, still experimenting with those. But um, like candy cap um, is that one's a fantastic one to infuse. Um, I made a candy cap mead a couple years ago, and that was that's awesome, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I made a chaga mead one time, which cool. was delicious. Uh, what is your chef background? I know you've like I want to say I've heard you worked in some restaurants before. Do you have any like formal training or anything like that? I don't. Yeah. Um, I have worked in a few restaurants here and there. Um, and then quickly realized that working in a kitchen, uh, a commercial <laughs> kitchen is not where it's at, <laughs> at least for me. Um, I would rather cook dinner for a small group of people. Um, I've done uh, just this year or sorry, last year I did a, I want to say like 12 or 15 course meal for um, just under 20 people. And wow. that was an, a just magical evening. You know, everything had, every dish had wild food flavors in it and featured something um, very unique and unusual. And it was uh, just a beautiful experience for everyone. Yeah, I used to overly romanticize the whole kitchen experience I, I had a big like anthony bourdain phase and i was like oh yeah i want to be a chef I, i'm like i don't think i could hang in that environment uh it's but i rough. do love yeah yeah I, I could only imagine i've never done it but uh yeah i'll stick to being the home chef here but um uh when you're doing these wild foods dinners who's helping you out or, or are you doing everything uh, I used to do everything, um, oh. but now I have my partner, uh, oh, nice. Mike, and he he is my personal sous chef, and <laughs> he, uh, he is fantastic in the kitchen. He's really great at um, helping out and all the prep work and um, even the high action stuff. He's really, really great at um, doing as well. So that's been kind of a game changer. And then... I, my kids are getting older, so I'm hoping to have yeah. them help out as well and, uh, you know, get them more exposed to all these foods and, and also seeing people's reactions too, I think is, um, important. Absolutely. Uh, I was originally going to ask you this, but you seem like a good person to ask. Uh, I'm sure you know about the work of like, say the United Plant Savers, 
Um, is there any uh, concern about over harvesting some of these mushrooms, um, any sort of harvesting ethics and whatnot you'd like to share? That's a great question. Um, so when it comes to mushrooms, you know, I'm a lot less worried about sustainability and like over harvesting um, because, you know, you're uh, you're basically picking, you know, it's like picking apples off a tree. You know, you're not actually harming the tree itself. It will continue to produce um, giving, given uh, the conditions are right. You know, mm -hmm. the things that are detrimental, though, is going to be loss of habitat um, when people are stomping around and, and disturbing, the, um, disturbing the ground. You know, that's going to have an impact. So, you know, when I take people out, it's very small groups. We try to stay on the trail and make as as little impact as possible. Um, but, you know, that mycelium is there in the ground or in, you know, the um, trees and organic matter and whatnot. Um, they're going to continue doing their thing um, until there's no uh, food left. So when we start clearing land and putting in a shopping mall, that's the problem. That's where we're right. going to, you know, run out of space for these organisms. Um, but, when it comes to plants, you know, I'm definitely a lot more adamant about, you know, small harvests and only, you know, harvesting what you are going to actually use and, and all those ethics. All right. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I usually start the show with this question or one of the first couple questions, but we're a full half hour in, so I'm going <laughs> to ask it now. Um, we could kind of go the mycology route or the herbalist route or both, and I'm just kind of curious, who have been some of your mentors Ah, uh, so many. Um, right. Shoot. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to leave anyone out. <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, the mycology community is full of some really amazing people um, that I'm honored to have met and work with. Um, and, and it's so collaborative. We're all learning from each other. And... Um, Oh, yeah. I don't know if I can name any names right now. That's fair. Um, but Where'd you study herbalism? I got a master's in science from the American College of, of Healthcare Sciences. Oh. Um, they're in Portland. And so, yeah, I'm also working on my doctorate right now with that, with them. I saw that. Uh, yeah. You want to tell us more about what you're working on in the doctorate? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'm just getting started. Um, haven't really refined my, uh, dissertation topic just yet, but, um, I'm very, very interested in, um, you know, the intersection of mushrooms and people and how they can be helpful for us, whether it's through psychedelics, whether it's through, um, you know, overall health benefits. Um, there's just so much interesting stuff that's happening right now that I'm just anxious to get involved in that that research and um, hopefully you know find some some good evidence to publish some some good you know helpful research I saw on your website you were I don't know if it was in stock or not but you were selling I want to say dried amanita mushrooms and that mm. kind of took me aback and I was wondering if that's even hi kitty <laughs> yeah that's my kitty that's Isabella what? Isabella Bella oh Bella cute mm -hmm. um I was I was kind of taken aback and I was curious um like the legalities behind that because the way I know it is like a well, I'm going to say and you could correct me if I'm wrong I want to say there's toxicity to it but then also um it's like a drug-like substance so mm -hmm. I was just curious if you could speak about that I am happy to. Yeah. Amanita muscaria is one of my favorite mushrooms. And um, I've been working with that for a, a long time um, as a culinary mushroom for one. Really? Yes. Yes. Wow. So this mushroom, while it does contain compounds that will, um, you know, give you some, not necessarily hallucinations, but uh, a, put you in a delirious state um, and some you know, gastrointestinal distress and make you feel pretty off and weird. Um, but all those compounds are water soluble. So 
they can be removed by uh, boiling them for between seven to 15 minutes, um, discarding that water, unless you want to save that water for dinner and a movie. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, otherwise, you can then cook the mushrooms as you would normally saute them with butter and whatever. They're actually very delicious. Um, mm. Amanita uh, genus mushrooms can be pr some of the more tastier ones, in my opinion. Mm. Um, but yes, they also are used um, medicinally. Um, they can, they're really good at um, addressing pain topically. So by uh, making a alcohol extract with them um, and using that topically can help reduce pain. Mm. And then, of course, there is the more, let's say, spiritual side of them. And there's a lot of people who are starting to uh, do some research on its effects with, um, you know, sleep issues and depression and anxiety and all these similar um, issues that are being addressed with psilocybin, but it's legal. Amanita muscaria mm. is not an illegal mushroom, and they mm. are widely available all across the country. And while they can produce kind of a weird and uncomfortable or um, not so great trip, um, there is, and, and they can be a little finicky too, like the dosing can be off. Um, some, uh, I believe it's like the, the Rocky mountain varieties are a little bit less potent than other ones. Um, so you don't always know what you're gonna, what you're gonna get, but, um, you know, that may be part of my, my research too. So it's, I think a very interesting and exciting, um, area to look into. Um, I know a lot of people are even trying microdosing with it. Wow. Um, and some interesting results. Very interesting. Yeah, I've never thought you could eat it before, just like as a culinary mushroom. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing you've been asked this quite a bit, but do you know like the 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 story of the relationship of the Amanita muscaria mushroom and Santa Claus? Is there a the yep. correlation there? Or... <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean. I would have to say, like, the first time I found Amanita muscaria was on the winter solstice wow. in Northern California under a Douglas fir tree that looks like a Christmas tree. And underneath, there were just all of these red and white mushrooms. I'm like, presents. oh, <laughs> look at the Christmas presents, you know. <laughs> and so the correlation, like the red and the white and the, you know, the idea of it's a gift you know and totally um yeah there's so many stories um and there's a lot of people who are you know kind of making the connection between those two um but you know i i stick more to the science side of things and but you know it all comes from somewhere you know people used to use these mushrooms before they even knew what they, you know, the chemicals were and, and how to work with them. So they knew there was something about these mushrooms that were really special. So there is something about stumbling upon a, an Amanita when you're hiking around. Like there is just such joy that happens when you see that mushroom. I've only seen them a few times out in the wild, but it's always like, wow, what a vibrant, beautiful mushroom. And even Super Mario loves it too, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, that is has become our cultural icon of a mushroom. Like right. that's what people think of when someone says mushroom or you're on mm -hmm. your phone and you're texting, you need to uh, convey the idea of mushroom. It's an Amanita muscaria. That's our, our go-to image, you know, not a shiitake, not a uh, oyster mushroom. It's, it's an Amanita muscaria. Yeah. Earlier when I was uh, asking you about your, your, who have your mentors been um, for whatever reason, I, I flash back to, I used to go to the wild flower, uh, or the native plant society meetings. And then I'd also go to the mycology society meetings in, in Eugene, Oregon. And there appeared to be like two different groups of people. I'm sure there was overlap, but for whatever reason, I was like, Oh yeah, these are the mushroom people. And these are the plant people. Um, 
and you know we're all a little, a little bit of both but um i feel like there is kind of a distinct style to the two groups and i was just wondering if you wanted to speak about your love of the the mushroom community specifically yeah um you know i have never felt more connected to a group of people um in my whole life and i'm always been kind of a outsider kind of a lone wolf type person <laughs> who has always you know never quite found my crowd and then when it came to uh the mushroom community it was like oh here they are <laughs> and you know these are people who love food love going outside love walking around in the rain um picking mushrooms and you know have a love for mushrooms i was finally felt like yep this is it these are these are my people and you know we're i think just a group of of misfits who come to mushrooms from just all sorts of different angles you know there's there's chefs, there's scientists, there's um, artists, and there's people who just like walking around the woods, you know? Um, so there's so many different types of people. And, you know, yes, there's some competition when it comes to spots and, and all that. But for the most part, it's all all in fun. But yeah, there's some people who will never, ever, ever share their spots and you're going to be in big trouble if, um, you know, you let that secret out. Absolutely. Have you ever been to the mushroom festival in Eugene, Oregon, the Mount Pisgah mushroom festival? Not that one. I have been to okay. many, many across okay. the country, <laughs> but I haven't made it to that one yet. Uh, I just got to say, so speaking of like plant people and mushroom people, I want to say the wildflower festival brings in around 1500 people per event. And that's always in May at Mount Pisgah. And then the mushroom festival brings in like eight to 10,000 people. Wow. And they'll, they'll go rain or shine. It's always mm -hmm. raining. Actually, it's all, all Sunday and it's just raining the whole time. And yeah, you really can't stop the mushroom people from going out and enjoying their mushrooms. Oh no, oh, no. <laughs> it'll be pouring rain. Um, just like last weekend, I was at an, an event called Soma camp and it was mm. pouring rain and there was a nine o'clock at night uh, UV light hike uh, to look at mushrooms under UV light. Wow. And it was packed. The whole class was packed, walking around in pouring rain, nine o'clock at night. It's freezing cold to look at mushrooms under UV <laughs> light. And, you know, and you were like, loving it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good time. And uh, yeah. So you mentioned you've been to lots of different mushroom events. I'm guessing you've been to the Tilleride, which is one of the most famous ones. Uh, can you tell us a little, little bit about that event? Yeah. So that was, yeah, that was my first mushroom festival. And after that first year, I was hooked and oh. went back every single year. Just, you know, I'd make the 14 hour drive uh, to go out there for a week and I mean, not only the, just the beautiful scenery in that, you know, part of the Rocky Mountains, which is just magical, um, but the, you know, the community of people that make that trip every year from all over the country, you know, and um, it's just something really awesome to be part of and getting to know more and more people over the years. And it's, it just, you know, it's, it's really good. It's really good. So it was like a 14 or eight, 18 hour drive for you. One thing I know about you is you love to travel. You're all over the place. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about traveling with a forager's perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So um, over the last eight years, um, you know, after my divorce, I really just kind of took to the road, um, mm. you know, going back and forth because, you know, custody with my kids and stuff. But um, every chance I could get, I was going somewhere new, going somewhere, um, exploring new places and um, and tasting what those places were like, um, you know, getting to have 
huckleberries in the Pacific Northwest and, um, you know, mesquite beans in the Southwest um, and, you know, all the different kind, types of mushrooms on the East Coast and uh, uh, harvesting sassafras. And um, it's, you know, a lot of people go and travel and they go to a mainstream restaurant, you know, and or maybe it's a, you know, smaller mom and pop restaurant, but you're still like ordering lasagna or a hamburger <laughs> and you're eating the same types of food. And maybe they'll have like, oh, it's a local dairy. You know, we get our cheese from a local dairy. Okay, cool. But what does that place really taste like? You know, um, I spent a little bit of time up in Alaska and tasting just totally different flavors of different herbs and and berries that you know you don't find at the store nobody sells them and that i think is one of the coolest things i love about travel you know mm -hmm. um getting to you know even going to mexico and um tasting all the different herbs down there uh collecting damiana in southern mm -hmm. baja you know and that th those are the memories that really stick with me. Um, it's one thing I teach in, especially like my kids' classes, is is it, you know you're really gonna hold on to these this information and these memories when you are involving all of your senses, when you're able to see, touch, taste, feel, um, even the sounds. You know that's why in that Matsutake description I add sound. You know, mm. because it, it it really brings home an experience and a memory. And you're going to remember that, you know, like I remember the sounds of the birds in a, you know, certain mountain range that was really special to me. And I can really, you know, if I think about it, I can go back to that in my mind. And it's a really rich and, and um, you know, meaningful experience. When you're traveling and foraging, are you going out there with the intent of collecting various ingredients and then you're bringing them back home uh, and then making a meal with it? Um, you mentioned like, say, the huckleberries in Oregon. I mean, that you could just kind of pop a bunch in your mouth right there and get the, the taste of that location. Or are you like collecting a bunch of these, bringing them back to your hotel or Airbnb and then creating food with it? Well, um, I don't usually get an Airbnb or a hotel. I usually travel in my van or a rental car. Oh, respect. Um, so I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so I have traveled very cheaply um, mm. over the last many years. And I love it. yeah, I have a whole van that's, I have an apothecary in my van uh, with different that's herbs awesome. I've collected. Um, and I'm always, I'm generally collecting, you know, for personal use and, you know, I'm very aware of, you know, I'm a stranger in these lands. I'm not here to just take everything I can find. Um, but, you know, sampling in small amounts, um, taking back, you know, maybe collecting some leaves for some tea that I'm going to have um, at a later date and, you know, remember that experience. Um, but yeah, like the huckleberries, I brought them home for my oldest daughter because she, mm. we had had huckleberry ice cream in Montana um, several years ago. And she was like, like, Oh, I really miss huckleberry ice cream. And I was like, Oh, you know what? I happened to have, you know, I was up in Oregon and I collected a bunch and, and brought them home. And, and, you know, that was a, a meaningful connection. And your daughter looked at and you said, you know, mom, you're pretty cool. Didn't <laughs> she? <laughs> she will on occasion admit that, but most of the time, <laughs> You know, I drop her off at, at high school and she's like, mom, drop me off, you know, not in front of the school and do <laughs> oh not my gosh. go pick those mushrooms. Because, I, you know, I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of honey mushrooms, right. Right, you know, right there in the front of school. And she's like, absolutely not. <laughs> do not get out of the car, mom. Drive away. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Typical teenagers. Yep. Uh, do you ever make your way out towards the Midwest? You know, that is actually an area that I have not been to. Um, I was supposed to go to the Midwest 
women's herbal, herbal. conference. Yep. Um, and I ended up having to cancel due to a uh, an issue at home. So I was like, finally excited to make it out there, but I, I did not. So that's on my list of an area I need to explore. I ask for a couple of reasons. I'm sure you're aware of Sam Thayer's work. Yes. Uh, wild foraging expert. He has a, uh, I want to say he's the host of, of this wild foods event. Um, mm -hmm. And it's every summer. Um, I would definitely recommend looking into that. Um, and, you know, just selfishly, then I could just drive down the road and meet you in person. <laughs> we could hang out because we live in Appleton, Wisconsin now. But oh. uh, Amanda and I have this idea. Uh, you, I don't know if you remember this MTV show called Cribs. Uh, but back in the day, they would show like different celebrities, houses and stuff. And Amanda and I, every time we visit and interview different herbalists when we're on the road, we're always like, herbalists have the coolest homes. I want to like capture some of this and like share it with the rest of the world. And I was like, I think it'd be cool to do a van edition with Jess Starwood and see your your herbal van. That would be so fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah, I, um, I have you know, built it out to be, you know, what I would need as somebody who collects things. And, um, you know, I'm often have stuff hanging from the roof because I'm drying herbs and, um, yeah, I'm surprised, uh, you know, someday there's going to be mushrooms growing up from under the floorboards, I'm sure, but, you know. <laughs> does the van have a name? It doesn't. Um, no, I've no. never named my vehicles, so. Fair, fair enough. Well, why don't we talk about your your school? It's called the Wild Path School, if I'm mm -hmm. getting that right. Can you share a little bit of, about what that's all about and when classes in session and all that? Yeah, so um, I have several different levels of participation for that program. Um, you know, over the years, people, you know, they would come to my classes and like, I I want more. I want to be more like you. <laughs> like, totally. okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, so I developed a apprenticeship program where people can, you know, work with me one on one, and I basically teach them everything I know. Um, we go out into the wild um, uh, every other week, and you know, field trips and like hands on. Everything is, you know, you're right there with me, um, and then getting experience um, helping in the kitchen to get ready for an event so working with all the different wild foods and flavors and and all that um, but it also includes one day classes for people who are you know casually interested um, and I have right now is it's mushroom season here in Southern California so I have a mushroom series of uh, I think it's four different classes and that gives you a full like I think it's 16 or 18 hours of you know out in the field in the kitchen um you know the whole range of learning how to find identify and use you know the wild mushrooms we have here awesome so mm -hmm. folks want to learn more about the classes the book uh your wild foods dinners that's all under the umbrella of jstarwood.com yeah mm -hmm. awesome we will leave links as per usual in the podcast show notes in the youtube description um also, before we get out of here, I saw you post a, a really beautiful post. By the way, dear listener, go check out Jess Starwood. Is it at Jess Starwood on Instagram? Uh, yes, Jess.Starwood. Okay, you got a great feed, and I'm presuming you. you do a lot of those photographs as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I'm a big fan of persimmons, and I saw you <laughs> post about this thing called uh, Hoshigaki. Yeah. Am I getting that right? Yeah. I never heard that term. I myself, I love food. This is like a new concept for me. Um, I'm just hoping you could share with the audience, A, what is hoshigaki and why do you love persimmons so much? <laughs> yeah, so hoshigaki is a Japanese technique of preserving uh, persimmons. And persimmons in general are one of my favorite fruits. Um, I know some people are like, oh, they don't have a whole lot of flavor, but I <laughs> I like subtle flavors. I like um I love the different types of them, you know, the, the Fuji ones, which are more like eating an apple. And then there's the, um, the Hachia persimmons, which are the more heart-shaped ones that are super astringent if they're not mm. fully ripe. So um, there's this cool process of Hoshigaki where you take the unripe um, Hachia persimmons and you peel them and then you hang them 
to dry um, over probably about like a month and a half, you know, wow. six to eight weeks. Um, but you have to massage them every day. And that helps to distribute the sugars. They're going to develop this really beautiful uh, powdery looking sugar coating on the outside. Um, and then at the end of that process, you just slice them up and eat them like candy. And they're wow. super tasty. Is it kind of like fruit leather tasting? Like, kind or of. not tasting, but like the texture, it's like a, it's like a mm -hmm. dried fruit, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. it's like a little gummy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll have, ask Amanda when she's editing it. Can we throw in the picture that you have on your Instagram account? Yeah, that, definitely, oh, yeah. Su sweet, awesome. Yeah, I'm going to have to give that a go. Plus, yeah, just having them hanging around your house is kind of pretty and everything. So, um, awesome. Well, to hear about any upcoming projects you have and uh, if that involves creating a, a Wild Foods cookbook. <laughs> Are you going to be uh, pulling that off at any, at any point? Well, uh, yeah, I keep wanting to make a cookbook or follow up with another book for sure. Um, I'm not sure what that's going to be. I'm going to focus on my doctorate for the next couple of years and then oh, right. see where see where <laughs> that leads um and but i'm you know I, I do give away recipes pretty freely so people coming to classes i'm always giving out recipes um but i i am involved in a lot of the mycological uh, societies i do a lot of volunteer work a lot of organization of events because it's the events that really like they're just super cool, you know, getting people Absolutely. together, go hunt in the woods uh, for mushrooms, eat mushrooms, all that stuff. So we are, my partner and I, uh, Mike, we are doing a, organizing a really big event uh, coming up in August um, in conjunction with the North American Mycological uh, Association. And we are going to be hosting about 100 people um, to go out on forays and uh, also heavily, heavily focused on the culinary aspect. So we're gonna be eating some really fantastic mushroom focused food uh, with some, you know, some high-end chefs. And uh, I'm super excited to be, you know, putting that together. Um, fantastic. So yeah. Yeah, where should folks go to like stay updated on all your work? I, I'm on your newsletter. Would you say that's mm -hmm. the best place? Yeah, the newsletter is going to be probably the best. Um, I do everything myself, so all my advertising probably could be better. But you know, it's um, at least it's all very beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So newsletter, website, Instagram. Um, I do Instagram stories a lot, and that's usually like in the moment updates on what's happening, what's going on. Um, and I'm always happy to chat with folks on social media and um, yeah, bringing Sweet. the community together. Rad. Well, uh, let's kind of wrap up here. Just kind of curious, uh, what's the mission of your work? And then maybe just a couple closing thoughts if you have any. Uh, the mission of my work. Um, is to hmm, satisfy the hunger for connection in people. I, um, I did a presentation last summer that I just pulled out this name for my talk was Hungry for Connection. And I'm like, that is what I'm doing. I'm People are hungry for connection. People want to connect. And, you know, all this world of technology that bring, you know we think we're being brought together but we're not you know i easily can sit in my house or my van for weeks on end and not see another person um you know we need connection not whether it's through people food our environment um our community so that i think is at the very essence of what i'm doing and yeah people can have something cool to eat or taste or um, you know, they get to see some pretty trees and, and mushrooms and moss and ferns, but you know, it's that connection that we're all looking for. And that is what I'm, what I'm trying to do. That's a great, 
uh, place to wrap up, I'd say you're doing awesome work, Jess. It was really Thank great you. to get to know you over the past hour. Thanks again for bearing with me through those technological difficulties and um, really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, we'll see y'all in the next episode. And that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's JOIN to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving text, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.